Amen. Well, finally, we get to start our new study. I'm thankful that we could walk together through the study of eschatology and walk through uh, the events of things to come. And wanted to do a study that I thought was interesting. And I always like to visit books that we don't talk about often. And the book that we're going to be looking at for um, several weeks, probably won't be as long as we did our eschatology study, is the book of Esther. And I, there's a good title for this, and it's God's Got This, The Truce on God's Sovereignty from the book of Esther. And we're going to give a little bit of an introduction um, tonight on this. We're going to talk about the author what the tradition says about that. Also, we're going to look at the date of the writing and then some questions that uh, lead up to that. Well, first of all, let's think about who is the author here of the book of Esther. Well, the book of Esther does not specify a name for its author. Um, there's been a lot of tradition that states that maybe uh, Mordecai, a major character in the book of Esther, uh, maybe pen these words. Um, there's also th thought that Ezra uh, possibly penned these words. Uh, it may have been Nehemiah, uh, who had been very familiar with the Persian customs during this time. So it's very possible that these individuals that are mentioned here, these are popular traditions, could have been the author of this actual book, the book of Esther, but no one really knows 100% for sure because it's not actually detailed here about who is the author. Well, the date of writing for the book of Esther was likely written between 460 and 350 B.C. That was likely when it was written. Uh, one important verse that I think is important for this book uh, comes from Esther 4. And we'll revisit this verse one more time, or many times throughout this study, is verse number 14 of chapter 4. And it says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such? I think that's a very important verse for this book. For such a time as this. Why I think that's such an important verse is because also for our lives today, we could more than likely say that as well. For such a time as this that we live in today. Now, Esther had a big role to play. And she was a lady that had to stand up, even if it was going to cost her her life for the people, the Jewish people, she stood in the face of adversity. And I think that there's times that, like this verse says, for such a time as this, that we've also got to take a stand. We've got to take a stand for which is right. Even if it is a risk, uh, maybe it's a risk for us of, of having something bad said about us by people because we stand for truth. We still have to stand for truth. And I think that's a very important verse as we continue with uh, this study. And I keep coming back to that. But here's a question. Do you ever feel forgotten by God when circumstances happen? Here's some questions. These are just questions to think about. Do you wonder if He still knows your address, where you're at? Just some questions to think about. If He has a plan for your life, if He's able to help with all the needs that you have going on. Uh, here's a question that we often ask. Do you ever feel discouraged while looking at the state of our country? Well, absolutely. We can look at the state of what's going on and feel discouraged. Well, I believe this book here, the book of Esther, is a place that we can find encouragement. And we're going to find that through this. Um, Esther... And the children of Israel lived in a godless culture with wicked, wicked leaders. This was during this time. Uh, Esther herself faced much heartache and disappointment. 
But despite the paganism that abounded and the sorrows that Esther faced, God was still sovereign ruler of the universe, just as He is today. I've said this, and I'll continue to say it. It doesn't matter what happens in the White House. It doesn't matter what happens in our country. It doesn't matter who is the President of the United States. It doesn't matter what happens in our world today. God is still on the throne, still in control, and He is a sovereign, sovereign God. And from the story of Esther, we can learn how to stabilize our souls in the sovereignty of God. Okay? See, no scheme can ever thwart the purpose of God. Satan has tried. He's tried many times. We've discussed this. We discussed it when we went through our study on eschatology. But there is no scheme whatsoever that can thwart the purpose of a sovereign, holy God. Nothing can. Isaiah 40, 17 tells us, All nations before Him are as nothing, and they are counted to Him less than nothing and vanity. Isaiah 46 also says, verses 9 through 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So this is talking about the sovereign God that is in control of all things and control of the universe. Now, just a little information here about Esther to give you a little background. While Esther was living in Shushan, the capital of the Persian Empire, many of the Jews had already returned to Jerusalem. Now, the book of Esther was written in part, the reason why it was written in part, to remind the Jews in Jerusalem that God had not forgotten them. That's why I started out this evening talking about, have you ever thought maybe for a moment that God has forgotten you, forgotten you in your circumstance? Well, this was a reminder that God's not forgotten where you're at. Um, oftentimes, I've heard of stories where men have went off to serve in the mission field, had went to serve in a, in a situation that's way off the beaten path and are witnessing to tribes and are trying their best to further the gospel. They're honoring God and sometimes have gotten a little discouraged because they're not seeing the results and they wonder, where is God? But God's not forgotten about God's not forgotten about us. He's not forgotten about His purpose. And though the Israelites were scattered, God was still working on their behalf through this story that we're going to talk about. He remained intimately involved in every, every area of their story. And we all have a story. And if you look at the story of our life, you can see God working in the details. You can see Him working through the circumstances. You can see Him working in the plan. And the entire story, this is important, the entire story of Esther is truly God's story. Okay? Now the book is entitled The Book of Esther, and we oftentimes hear it. It's a wonderful story. There's been a movie that's been made. It's a great movie. If you want to check it out one time, it's called One Night with the King, and it's powerful about this story. It's a biblical story. And the entire story of Esther is truly God's story. And what is that? A story of redemption. That's what it's about. Now, in this book, we see how God provided salvation for the Jews from genocide. Okay? Haman wanted to annihilate them, to take them out. And this book is more than a story about the Jews. It reveals how God shows us goodness and sovereignty through working behind the scenes. You know, it's amazing. Oftentimes we don't see how God's working behind the scenes. We miss that. But that's how He works, how He puts things together. So first of all, let's look at this tonight about His story. Now, Christian historians remind us that history is... His story. And God is the author of history, and studying the past reminds us of His sovereignty. 
You look back at the past of humanity and you see His sovereignty in stories of the Bible. You see it throughout Christian history. You just see His sovereignty that is there. And God is the author of history. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 8. We read this also when we did our study. I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, it is interesting to note that God's name is not mentioned once. Did you know that? Is not mentioned one time in the book of Esther. At a surface level, someone may read it merely as a story of political intrigue. This is interesting. It's a lot of political stuff that's involved within this book. Attempted genocide. Wow! That would really make a, a great book to read about how that was thwarted how that that genocide was avoided. Man, that would make a great read. Also for feminine courage, it would show young women that there's a woman that stood in the face of adversity. Man, that would be a great read. And happy endings. We love happy endings to a story, right? We don't like those dark, left open endings. It's sort of like you, you read a book and you read it and then at the end it says to be continued and you have to wait a long time to get the next book. You ever had that happen before? But it's a happy ending that we see here. But the most important thing to notice about Esther is the beauty of Esther's story is that it reveals, it reveals the powerful and intricate sovereignty. Now we're going to talk about that a lot of God that is working behind the unfolding scene of Esther and the Jews. G. uh, Campbell Morgan actually said this. He said, While there is no name of God and no mention of the Hebrew religion anywhere, no one reads this book without being conscious of God. I really like that. Also, Matthew Henry, a commentator, said this, If the name of God is not here, His finger is. And when you read the book of Esther, you will see, yes, God's name is not mentioned there by name, but His finger is there on the circumstances. His finger is there on the story, and we're going to find that out. And so it is with our lives as well. Although God is not always seen or mentioned, He's always at work. You know, there's been times I've thought, God, are you working? You know, we probably have asked that question before. God, are you working in this circumstance? We may think he's not working, but he's working. And he's doing and working it out according to his perfect will. Now, how does Esther's story show us that God's got this? Remember that was what I told you at the beginning, that God's got this. Well, first of all, we see a story of providence. Providence. Now, although God's name is not mentioned, it repeatedly emphasizes the providence of God. The book opens with words that set the political scene in Persia under the reign of Ahasuerus. Okay, this is Esther chapter 1, uh, verse number 1. Let's read this. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus that is, this is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, under over 170 and 20 provinces. Now, a little history of the Persian rulers. Now, we're going to get into some Persian history here. This really sets the tones for where we're going. A little history of the Persian rulers and their biblical significance helps to provide context for Esther's story. Cyrus II ruled from 559 until 530 B.C. Uh, He was also known as Cyrus the Great. That was another name that he was referred to as. Permitted some Jews to return and build the temple. Now amazingly, God had prophesied. Now catch this. God had prophesied in Isaiah that Cyrus would do this some 150 years before Cyrus actually took power. Listen to what it says here in Isaiah 44, 28. That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built 
and to the temple of thy foundation shall be laid. Just a little bit of information there. That's 150 years before it was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Now, besides revealing the amazing power of God to do prophecy and perform His will, this verse shows us that God used heathen kings. You know, we see throughout the story of Israel where God used heathen nations to put them underneath His thumb. And when they were disobedient, He used heathen. Um, We've seen that many times throughout the Scripture. Uh, Another king that we see here, a ruler, is Cambyses. And he ruled from 530 to 522 B.C. Now, all these are Persian rulers. Um, Darius I ruled from 522 to 486 B.C. And Darius was king of Persia during the ministry of the Old Testament prophets Haggai and Zechariah. Now, their ministry was primarily to call the people to finish rebuilding the temple and encourage them in the work. The rebuilt temple was finished and dedicated in 515 B.C. Xerxes ruled from 485 to 465 B.C. And although referred to in Esther by his Persian name, Ahasuerus, he is usually referred to in history books by his Greek name, Xerxes. Um, So Xerxes ruled from 45 to 465 um, B.C. Now, Ahasuerus, that guy that we just referred to though, the Xerxes, the Greek name there, ruled the Persian Empire when it was at its zenith, okay? And at this time, it was the greatest and it was the largest. It was the largest empire to that point in world history. I mean, it was like the spectacle. It was like the place to be. And this empire included 127 provinces, one of which was actually Judah that was during this time. Now, this is described in the opening of Esther. Now, here's something that's important. Another thing to really focus in on as we begin this. The very first words of Esther provide the human perspective. Ahasuerus was ruling, okay? He was the guy. He, he was the dude, okay, here in the Persian Empire. But the rest of the book provides the divine perspective. God was in charge. Even though this was a zenith, this was the place to be, this was a popping, popular place, God was still in charge. Remember that sovereignty. God was still in control regardless of how powerful Xerxes, Ahasuerus, whatever you want to refer to him as, was. Now, King Ahasuerus was not the leader anyone would be thrilled to have. Uh, With persuasion from Haman, Ahasuerus capriciously made an irrevocable degree to have all the Jews killed. Now, this is just, we're doing a little summary, but we'll go in depth as we continue with this study. Okay, this just kind of sets the stage. Um... He was an erratic man. He had a lot of significant power, as you can see, being a Persian ruler. And even with the most erratic ruling on earth, it didn't matter how erratic he was, didn't matter what decisions he made, it didn't change the fact that God was in charge. God was in charge. And in His providence, God is able to concentrate... All his attention in every place at all times. And that's central, so important with the book of Esther. The theme of God's providence is constant in the book of Esther. Now, what does providence mean? I've been using that word a lot. Well, let's look at what providence means. The word providence is from the Latin word providio. Pro means beforehand. And video means to see. Now, we would know that. You get a video, you get it to see. Put it together and it means to see beforehand. So the theme of God's providence is constant in the book of Esther. And what does that tell us? Nothing surprises a holy God. He sees it all. He knew and he had all of this 
under control underneath His sovereignty. Augustus Strong once said this, Providence is God's attention concentrated everywhere. That's an important quote there. Now, let's consider God's providence leading up to Esther uh, 1. Now, prior to the rise of any of the Persian kings, God had used the Babylonian Empire to conquer the Israelites and take them into captivity. Remember where I talked about heathen nations. He used heathen nations to bring them into submission. This was His judgment on Israel for forsaking Him. Um, I'm reading right now with Titus with his homeschool. We're going through uh, the Old Testament. And uh, it was funny. I was reading some of the stories and talking about how that the Israelites had forgotten God and they would always beg for God to get them out of this situation. And he looked up at me and he said, Dada, he said, when are they ever going to learn? <laughs> well, that's a good question. You would think they would have learned. But isn't that the same for us today, though? Is that... God brings us through time and time again. And what happens when we get into another rough situation? We forget. And uh, we, should let, we should never forget about how awesome our God is. And regardless of what we face, He can bring us out of. But we've got to be submissive. We've got to be willing to follow after Him. Um, but this was His judgment on Israel for forsaking Him, even as God warned Israel of the coming judgment, he promised he would bring the nation back to their homeland. Okay? Now, the Babylonian Empire was defeated by Cyprus II of the Persian Empire. It was this Cyrus who fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 44. Remember that prophecy that was fulfilled all those years before releasing many of the Jews to return to Israel to excuse me to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. This is 2 Chronicles 36, 22 through 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Now, decades earlier, when King Nebuchadnezzar, I always used to say, I used to say it short for just King Neb, if you want to say that, if you can't really pronounce that. King Nebuchadnezzar. Decades earlier, when King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Israel, many of the Jews must have felt abandoned by God. But the reality was that God was still at work, even in their lowest moment. Um, looking at the timeline of Persian kings from a human perspective, it is obvious to see their historical progression I mean, that's very easy to see um, because during this time of Ahasuerus, Xerxes, whatever you refer to him as, you could see the progression. But also it's obvious from a scriptural standpoint to see God's sovereignty working through heathen rulers. Um, oftentimes you talk to people about that and say God used heathen rulers um, to accomplish His purpose. And they say, what? Yeah, if you read the Old Testament, you see that very clearly. And that's an important thing to notice in the history of the Israel people, Israelite people. Psalm 145, verses 15 through 16. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. And that's obvious about our God. Well, not only do we see the story of a providence, but also let's look at a story of grace. Um, God had been gracious to allow some Jews to return to Jerusalem. In the book of Esther, we see His grace to the Jews still in Persia. The Bible tells us that when some Jews went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, others stayed in Persia but gave to the work. This is found in Ezra chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. 
Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place let him help him with silver and with gold and with the goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in uh, Jerusalem. So how did God show His people grace? Well, first of all, grace is found in God's remembrance. Surrounded by the Persian culture, many of the Jews in Shushan, remember we mentioned that earlier, may have forgotten about their God, but God had not forgotten them. What's an important thing, and it's an important reminder for us about God does not forget His promises. He does not forget the things that He's promised to His people. But also grace in God's purpose. God still had a purpose. They felt they were far from home. And He was still committed to His covenant with them. See, that covenant that Jesus was talking about. Remember when we talked about there in eschatology, the covenant that had God has with the nation of Israel? There's that covenant that keeps coming back into play. And even in Persia, God worked powerfully on their behalf to bring about His purpose through them. He's not forgotten. He's made that covenant. He made that promise to Abraham. And here we see that all of that, God still, still remembers. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to to his purpose, we hear that quoted so many times. But a constant important reminder for us. Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So not only do we see his story, but let's look at his saints. Now, this is a story about God, but what is so humbling, however, this is the humbling aspect of this story, and it's humbling for us as well as we begin this journey, is that God uses sinful people to carry out His story. Esther was a sinful individual. She wasn't perfect, but God used her, a sinful individual. God uses me. He uses you. We're sinful individuals. We've all missed a mark. I'm thankful today so much for the precious blood of Jesus Christ, but also at the same time, I'm so, it's such a humbling thing just to know that God would use a person like me. And you say the same thing. It's such a humbling experience when God uses you for His purpose and His plan. And here we see this in the captive of Israel to fulfill His chastening work of, on Israel, God raised up Babylon, uh, later conquered by Persia, to conquer Judah and take the nation captive for 70 years. This happened. Now when Babylon conquered Judah, the Jews were not in a good condition spiritually. Many of them were worshiping the gods of heathen nations. Um, this is where we find out that God had to teach them and he had to remind them and, and where they would get out and they would worship these false gods of these heathen nations and to draw his chosen people back to himself. God knew that his people needed to see their need. They needed to see their need for him. Jeremiah 24, 20, verse number 4. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and they shall slay them with the sword. But then, not only that, God raised up Persia to punish Babylon. This is Jeremiah 25, verses 11 through 12. And this whole land shall be a desolate and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass when seventy years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. 
So at times, God must humble us to raise, up, raise us up. He humbled them to raise them up. See, oftentimes in our pride, we may be tempted to trust in ourselves and become self-sufficient. Well, that really hits at home at times. There's oftentimes we think, oh, I got this figured out. I can do it all on my own. That's when we need a reality check. Um, And the Israelites thought this many times. Oh, God's protected us. He's brought us to where we're going to go. We'll just do things our way. We'll forget about this promise. We'll forget about these things that God told us not to do. We'll just do things our way. But that's when God had to set the record straight. But not only the captive of Israel, but the committed of Israel. Now, the Jews in both Shushan and Jerusalem were struggling. From a chronological context, the book of Esther fits. Many people believe it fits between Ezra chapters 6 and 7. That's where this book would actually fit in chronologically. In Jerusalem during this time, Jews were rebuilding the temple but were not totally committed to God. And this is seen, if you want to see this more in depth, this comes from Ezra chapter 1 through chapter number 6. Through this building, they were not committed. Um, It's sort of like... If you're building a house and your workers aren't committed and they're not showing up all the time, you're not going to get anything done. But this was the story that set the tone there, and they were struggling. Um, Now, in Persia, we find two of the main human players in the book, Mordecai and Esther. And we're going to mention them more in depth as we go through this study. In God's providence, there's that word again, He placed Mordecai, a godly Jewish man, in a strategic position. There are no coincidences. There are no mistakes. God is intentional on all things. And here we see here that in his providence, he places Mordecai, a godly Jewish man, in a strategic position. Listen to what it says here in Esther 2, verse 5, and then verse 7. Now in Shushan, the place where was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And then, we'll go ahead and read 6, that's okay. Who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And then verse number 7, And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Now, as an attendant in the king's gate, Now, this just gives you um, a little bit of background, sets up the story of where we're going. As an attendant in the king's gate, Mordecai may not have understood the importance of the positioning for the Jewish people or for God's plan that was about to unfold. I think about oftentimes, we're not really for sure either about why God puts us in the positions that we're in. Um, There's been times that God has led me to do something or led me into a situation and I felt led of the Spirit to do that and, and I'm thinking, God, I don't know the end result. I don't know why I'm here, but I'm just obedient to do what you've called me to do. And um, oftentimes we don't have the end result and how it's all going to unfold. But uh, I love a quote that says, uh, Faith is, is not knowing where one is being led, but loves and knows the one who's leading. I like that. So, what he did know, however, was that he did not ultimately serve the king of Persia, but the Lord God of Israel. That's what he knew. Now, something to think about. So often Christians are trying to focus so much on the where than on the who. The point of interest of Mordecai that will become important later in the story, and we'll find this out, is that he was a descendant of King Saul of the tribe of Benjamin. And this is found in Esther 2, uh, verses 5 through 6. Let's see that. Now, Esther's name, Hebrew name, was Hadassah. It's a real pretty name. Um, 
a Hebrew name, but her Persian name, of course, was Esther, which means, does anybody know what Esther means? Well, right there, there you go. <laughs> I had it up there for you, didn't I? Why would I give it away too easy, didn't I? <laughs> That's right. Esther means star. That is her Persian name. And she was a Jewish orphan in the middle of God's will. Could there be, just a thing to think about, could there be a less likely candidate for saving the Jews in Persia from genocide than a foreign orphan girl? God uses those things to confound the world. Who, did G- who followed after Jesus? They weren't brilliant men by no means. Fishermen, tax collectors, those men that followed after Jesus. But those men turned the world upside down, carrying the message of Christ to all parts of the world. After Jesus ascended back to the Father, historically, we know that the Different disciples went to different parts of the world carrying the gospel. And uh, very important to think about that. But Mordecai had raised his orphan cousin Esther as his own daughter. He loved her. He raised her as his own daughter. He loved her and was a wise guide in her life. And we'll see in a later study his counsel to not reveal her Jewish heritage no doubt actually saved her life. This is all part of God's plan. Okay, uh, Let's read here. This is Esther 2, 10 through 11. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now, we'll talk about that later, but that's just the scripture there for that. Um, Esther herself would demonstrate great trust in God, even placing herself in a danger and the possibility of death. This is Esther 4.16. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and the, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maids will fast likewise and so I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. Powerful here. And if I perish, I perish. Wow, that's when I when I read that and when I say it, that to me just speaks. God is in this situation; He's got His finger on this, and uh, very evident there. Just a very bold thing to go before the King here. Um, I'd like to share this with you. America's most beloved hymn writer. Fanny Crosby. Actually, I saw a little plaque today that had a quote um, of hers on it. It's Fanny Crosby wrote over 9,000 hymns, which includes some of the most popular hymns still sung today. Part of what makes her life so incredible is her blindness that was thrust upon her as an infant. Uh, When she was a six-year-old, baby, you may or may not know the story about this, she was treated for an eye infection by a man posing who was pretending to be a certified doctor. The imposter prescribed hot mustard poultices, I think that's how you pronounce it, poultices, to be applied to her eyes. And I don't know exactly what that is. It's something I, I really don't know. Anybody know what that is? I was trying to figure out... Is, like a hot pad or like a mustard pad or something? Okay. I saw that and I I hadn't heard of that, but this is interesting though. This treatment by this imposter caused her permanent blindness. Years later, uh, Fanny Crosby said, Do you know that if at birth I had been able to give, make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind? Because when I get to heaven... The first face that I shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. And in one of her most beloved hymns, All the way my Savior leads me, she wrote, For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all 
things well. And I think that in this situation, Esther was determined and knew that she was going to save her people and she was going to die doing it. And whether she died or she lived, that's why she said, and if I perish, I perish. But I've got to do this. Powerful. Um, that's why I'm saying this is an excellent story about God's story. But you see a, a, a young lady here, this orphan Jewish lady, um, whether you want to call her Hadassah with her Hebrew name or Esther, her Persian name, what a powerful story of someone that's willing to go to bat to save her people. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Just an interesting story, just a very powerful story. Uh, but thirdly here, last of all, and then we'll be done, is His salvation. The redemptive thread throughout Scripture is God's redemptive plan. Thankful for that. As we see Scripture and we see it unfold, that's what we see. Now in the story of Esther, we see God's redeeming power on full display. Uh, for the children of Israel, Mordecai took a stand for God when he refused to bow down to God's enemy Haman or worship another person. Uh, look what it says here in uh, Esther 3, 1 through 2. We'll revisit because we're going to go in deep, more detail each week. But after these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, Agagai, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were uh, with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Uh, he would not bow down. Now incensed by Mordecai's refusal to bow, Haman determined to kill not just Mordecai. This was an insult. But all the Jews, this is where it really just poked the bear. You ever heard that situation, poking the bear? Um, Kendra tells me that sometimes when I, with her cousins. I like to agitate them. She said, you're just poking the bear. I just did a little bit of agitating here and there. But here we see that Haman, does, he wanted that. He wanted people to bow down and reverence it. But when Mordecai would not, he took it a step further and determined not just to kill Mordecai, but all the Jews. He said, if you're going to do that, I'm just going to kill them all. Genocide. And then plotted to have Mordecai die in a public humiliating death on gallows that Haman built specifically for the purpose. However, an interesting twist, you may know the story, but uh, we'll touch on this too. An amazing twist of providential irony, the king ultimately promoted Mordecai to Haman's position and sentenced Haman to die the death he had provided for Mordecai. Um, sort of like he set this up for Mordecai, and for him to die this way, but he ended up being the one to die. Interesting as we see that twist. It was God who um, protected Mordecai, and it was God who promoted Esther um, to queen. So Mordecai and Esther proposed a plan that ultimately saved the Jews from the genocide Haman had planned. And even as the Jews were set to be destroyed, so mankind was sentenced to face death and judgment but I'm thankful today that we had one that went to the cross and he conquered death. He conquered the grave. Because of that tonight, we can sit here with hope knowing that when we die one day or the rapture comes, there's a place that we're going to. It's called heaven. And we're going to see Jesus one day. But uh, what an excellent story. And I, that's just, just a little bit. There's more. We're going to talk about more verses, but this is just a little bit of an introduction talking about Esther, and um, just thought that'd be a good way to start it off. But God's got this, and it's seen through this story, and we'll talk about more each week. This ain't going to be a long study, but I thought it, I thought it would be good to visit because this is not a book we read often. So, anybody got a question? Anything that kind of stirred your curiosity? Hopefully, this is interesting. There's a lot of historical stuff there with Persia and. A lot of things that you have to understand about why this situation is here and why the Jews are in the position that they're in. So. Not as many questions about this as there is eschatology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's right. Anybody have a thought or question? Yeah. I pray you like it and enjoy it. Um, like I said, I, I like I, I find these fun to go back and visit stuff that we don't talk about a lot and a book that we don't read from that often either. But um, excellent story, though, and seeing how God was working behind the scenes. Very interesting to see. All right, we'll finish a little early tonight. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll have a word of prayer. <coughs> Father, thank you for this time together this evening. Thank you for your truth. Uh, thank you for this study in a book, Esther, of the Bible. Um, canonical, it's one of the 66. Uh, we know that your name, O oh God, is not mentioned there, but like it's been said, your, your finger's there. Um, your sovereignty is very evident. Your providence is very evident as well. And what an excellent example of how you were in control how you used an orphan woman by the name of Esther, how you used a Jewish man by the name of Mordecai, and how you just um, used them for your purpose. And how today you work behind the scenes in our life and how that you give us and, and lead us to situations that at the time don't seem quite, um, we don't really understand. And I've been led to those myself before, but obviously we, we're faithful uh, to do what you've called us to do and um, we know that you're not going to lead us into anything, Father God, that's not going to accomplish your purpose. And we just pray that uh, um, we can always be found obedient and, and following you. And Father, we just pray for tonight for safety as we travel home. Thank you for our church. Pray for those that are sick. Uh, pray for those that have got difficult issues with families, with um, those that have had death in their families. We pray for all those situations. We love you so much. Thank you once again for all you do. Thank you for Jesus, and we ask all these things in his name. Amen. Amen.